Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to my presentation about um, the use of electrical thermal systems uh, to decarbonize the industrial sector. My name is Volker Metzger and I'm an applied thermal expert with uh, Wadlow. Just a brief overview about our company. Um, Wadlow is about 100 years in, in the market with electric uh, heating systems and uh, we have quite innovative technologies which we use uh, for um, uh, heating systems for decarbonization, in our case electrification. Uh, our company is headquartered in the US. We are about 5,000 employees um, to about 750 million in, in revenue and we are very technology orientated. You see that in the number of patents and also in the number of, of engineers we have. Um, products are manufactured mostly in the US and Mexico, but we also have a production site in, in uh, Europe. And we have seven advanced technology and development centers and two of them are also in, in Europe. Um, yeah, the driver for decarbonization, I think I can cover that quickly because I think the audience here is <laughs> very knowledgeable about that. It starts with the Paris Agreement um, with the 1.5 or 2 degrees uh, uh, maximum warming and net zero by mid-century. Um, we also have to enhance the resilience and the adaption for climate um, uh, impact to happen. And also the financial flows uh, have to be uh, directed to uh, achieve the objectives of the decarbonization. What I find interesting here is the this chart with the policies and laws, when we look in the early 90s, there was almost nothing around. And if you look nowadays, even this is 2016, there are a lot of uh, things to fulfill, laws and, and, and policies. And uh, yeah, that's a, a challenge, certainly. And um, if you look at the... Uh, um, gases uh, or where the gases, the greenhouse gases are produced. These are also, let's say, all sectors. It's not just transport or industry. Uh, you see here uh, electricity and heat production, buildings, transportation, industry, other segment of energy, also agricultural. Um, and also the gases. We talk a lot about carbon dioxide here, but also we have uh, methane, we have nitrous acid, we have fluorinated gases, which also impact the, the global warming. So that means the problem is very wide and very deep. So not only one approach is, is right. We are, or I'm talking here about electrification, but as we have seen today, there are a lot of different approaches to decarbonization. I think we can skip this one. Um, yeah, what are, the, what are the challenges here? Um, on the one side, the decarbonization challenge yeah, to uh, cover with all the laws and regulations. Um, and on the other side, companies still have to be profitable. Um, even they have to adapt new technologies and uh, 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 embrace a lot of, lot of changes. Um, the rate of change I think will go will go up because there is a, um, a demand from the from the end customer. We want a green product or a greener product, so um, the speed of change um, uh, increases. Then we have other challenges on raw material materials. If you look at the last years, a lot of increased cost. Uh, same problems with deliveries. They are longer and longer. Maybe there is some relaxation at the moment with semiconductor chips, but on other materials, we still talk about long delivery times and cost of energy really went up. Um, why do we look at um, electric process heat? Yeah, because um, we can use clean and renewable electricity to run the heaters. And if you look here at this map, for example, I think that's a, a UK diagram showing the different ways how electricity is produced. Coal is really reduced and um, uh, renewable 
um, energies are increasing. So if we run the heaters with clean energy, then we really get the benefit. I think we had a good, uh, oops, good discussion in the last presentation about the scope one and scope two emissions. Um, if you really win anything, if you just electrify a heater, um, yes, if you run it with green energy. No, if you run it with uh, energy from the coal power plant, plant around the corner. Um, we see here reduced cost of ownership because the heater is always equipped with a, with a control panel and so it really runs on its own. Um, therefore, it also has increased uptime. Um, uh, the heater is pretty effective, so everything, nearly everything you bring in as uh, electricity is turned into heat. Um, and so the, we say the grid is decarbonizing more quickly, so we think there is green energy available for running the heaters. And also if you think about renewable fuel production, SAF for example, um, yeah, people look for electric heat in these thermal processes which are the, uh, involved in SAF production, for example. What are the advantages or benefits of an electric system? There is less thermal lag. That means the heater is really driven with the electricity very directly and is also controlled very precise with the uh, control system. Um, it's safer and clean, so we don't burn any uh, fossil fuels. It has a smaller overall footprint because uh, at an electric heater, we have a very constant heat flux along the heating element on the surface of the heating element. Therefore, you can really shrink the heater if you compare it, for example, with a shell and tube heat exchanger, which has a non-constant heat flux. And we think we have a lower operating cost because we can run it unmanned. So if the heater and the control system are set up properly, the system more or less run on its, run on its own. Um, electric heaters are not new. For example, Watlow is uh, around uh, 100 years. Um, and process heaters are, we think, 75 plus years around. They are used in the industry, but more in niche applications. For example, if you look in a refinery, there are very dedicated applications, for example, in catalytic reforming, alkylation. These are typical electric applications, but the large heaters, if we look, for example, large reboilers or crude oil heaters, they were all non-electric. No one ever thought about in the past doing a, a crude oil heater with 40, 50 megawatt electric. Now, times change. And uh, we say a heater with one megawatt in the past was really large for electric. Uh, now we are working in packages between five up to 200 megawatt. That's certainly not one heater, but this is a, an arrangement of several trains and several heaters in series. But we have uh, uh, done a layout for a special system up to 200 megawatt uh, electric. And so more and more of these typical uh, gas-fired heaters, um, people look into electrification um, to, to turn that around into an electric heater. Some examples, um, that's a glycol reboiler. We have done that also in the past, glycol reboilers electric with some hundred kilowatt. Now we are looking at different sizes, for example here, uh, these are 15 megawatt in one heating bundle. Another reboiler for a, a distillation column. Um, traditionally, in this case, with a steam heated. Um, we have transferred that into an electrical heater. It's 12 megawatt with two heating bundles in, in this one vessel. One inserted from left, one inserted from right. And the interesting thing here is that is really two-phase flow. So we have the knowledge and the tools to calculate also electrical heaters for a two-phase flow application. That was also not common in the past. So electrical heaters were mainly, either it was liquid or gas. We have done some vaporizers, but not this kind of heaters in the past. Some more examples here, an A-mine reboiler. 
Um, we have done that also on smaller scale. And I have seen in the one of the earlier presentations also an amine reboiler, steam heated. Yeah, we could do that electrically. <laughs> um, in this case, 25 megawatt, uh, a steam generator, 78 megawatt in a, in a single package. So <clears throat> sizes are really increasing on the one side, and also temperatures are increasing. So we have a lot of heaters in the field which go up to, let's say, 650 C with very uh, long lifetime, so 10 plus years at least. Um, now people are looking at much higher temperatures also for electric heaters. Um, what is important if we talk about lifetime is really how to control the heater. Um, <clears throat> we have own um, uh, controls, power controls. We do own control cabinets, as you can see here. And we enhanced our capabilities really in the last uh, year with the acquisition of the company Eurotherm, which has a very strong offering in the uh, uh, controls, electronics, automation uh, segment. And so we really can deliver everything from a grid voltage, whatever you provide in the, uh, uh, as a, a medium voltage, yeah, down to the uh, control of the individual uh, heaters. And one thing is pretty interesting. We have a, a software for a load management, which really can share the, um, the power between different uh, tarista controllers that you don't go over your level, what you have from the, in your contract with the electricity company. So we avoid any peaks where electricity cost would be extremely high. This is currently available for up to 690 volts, so low voltage uh, <coughs> applications. Two minutes. Pardon? Two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, OK. We speed up and go to medium voltage. Now, um, as I said, uh, voltages are going larger and larger. If we do that still with 690 volts, if we replace these large uh, furnaces, we have a large step-down transformer. We have a very high amperage control panel. We have very, uh, a lot and very thick interconnection cables. A solution is we go to a medium voltage heater, which can operate. Currently, we have one at 4,160 volt, which can be operately, operated directly with that voltage. And we are de developing one up to 7.2 kilovolt, coming by the end of the year. So we can reduce the step-down transformer or sometimes avoid it, and we certainly save cost on the interconnection. And yeah, what is driving uh, yeah, reduction of the cost of the interconnection? Again, Paris Agreement, and you can run the system really remote, even on, 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 on drilling platforms, for example, unmanned. There are certainly some things to consider when you have a, a medium voltage system or develop a medium voltage system um, because of the much higher um, voltage. There are uh, uh, electrical risks like uh, arcing. The electric field is much stronger. Parcel discharge is more likely if you don't do it correct. So these are things which we which we have uh, covered in our system with arc mitigation, which is included in, in our, uh, in our uh, switching systems with, um, with an optical device. And uh, we still uh, develop the system in a way that the reliability and durability are still industrial standards. So we say we want to have at least 100,000 hours of <coughs> continuous operation for our system. And, um, there are, in the past, there were no standards for electric heaters, so we did things according to UL. Uh, now, Bottler was involved in this IOGP standard, S723, and okay, obviously, we also fulfill it. Um, and yeah, also, medium voltage heaters are covered in this standard. So, I think <laughs> more or less on time. Thank you for your. Uh, attention and thinking through really all of the improvements including 
very significant improvements that you can make through a combination of electrification and digitalization of the controls. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes. Any others? Over here. Okay. How are you doing? Uh, Daniel Mullen from SSE. Um, I suppose my question is just about the electrification of, uh, well, not really a question, but more of a comment about the electrification of heaters. Um, you mentioned an amine reboiler system. Um, I think it's important to delineate between different forms of heat and, and power, and I did some just back of the napkin calculations there. And if you were to normally power your CCGT, uh, say a normal CCGT with, with low-grade steam, the output penalty would be about 80 megawatts. If you electrify that, it's about 220 megawatts. So it's, it's a very different form of heat. Um, I think it has to be very specific. Um, if you have availability of low-grade heat, that's what you need to use, as opposed to electrification. Okay. And we can come back to that, but let's collect with the other question and then... Okay. Um, can I ask two questions, one each? <laughs> um, so, uh, to Andy, I was wondering whether you've gone through a LOPA um, of your proposals, um, because it's something that we would consider, obviously, um, loss of instrument error, loss of, of total power failure. I was wondering what, what you've done to, th how you thought about that. Um, I've actually got lots of questions to you for, for uh, Volker, so I have to I have to <laughs> hold off. But I was interested. Um, I believe are you from Germany? I'm from Germany. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what, um, how you're encouraging young people to get into engineering, um, which is possibly off topic a bit. But I'm just wondering how how that's working in Germany. I think that's a very important topic, gentlemen. Um, well, it, well, if I get that first one out of the way, yeah. and then you've got okay. two yeah. questions. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so, in, in terms of electric options, electric failsafe is a, is another option. You know, whether it's a mechanical or a or a hydraulic backup type system. So, so it you know in in terms of loss of of power, loss of air, you can still have the same performance or configuration with electric. Mm -hmm. Do you want to address the SSE point? No. Okay. Volker. Um, okay. Your question was about the. Uh, 220 megawatt versus. Great, and you know it's sorry. It's just it's it's. I suppose it's recognizing that the electrification might be better used to decarbonize elsewhere. If you have waste waste heat, as a lot of industrial processes do, it's not just a like for like translation between megawatts thermal and megawatts electricity. Um, that's that's clear. Yeah, if you have if you have excess heat, it's always better to use that first before you uh, invest in, in in further electricity for for a heater. I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. And on the question of building up the workforce. So so my reason for asking this is um, I think this in this country we're we're struggling to to get enough engineers um, get interest into engineering and enough. We, we need to um, help, we need to um, have engineers for the existing processes and all of the new ones as well. And I was just wondering whether Germany's doing any better than, than the UK in terms of um, getting people into engineering. Sorry, there's a off topic. I'm, but <laughs> I'm not sure if I can give you a good answer on that because we don't do much engineering for our uh, products and processes in Germany. So um, we, are, we are only a sales office in, in Germany and do some, let's say, system architecture. And then support is coming from the business unit uh, in, in the US or we have an application development center in, in the Philippines, in, in uh, Cebu, which really supports us on uh, this, this process heater work. And, um, yeah, I think some of the people even came from your company. <laughs> okay, so there's both a question of recruiting in Germany, but also of offering the jobs in mm -hmm. Germany. Okay, and similarly here. One more here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alfonso Garcia from Repsol. Uh, my question is to Volker. So um, considering that um, 
mm, the most of the emission that we have in our refinery is coming from processes that are working at high temperature, like a steam material former or a steam cracker. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee any limitation on the electrification of this process in terms of the temperature that they have to reach or the reliability of this equipment? Uh, yeah, these are certainly, I think, the two largest CO2 producing equipments, the steam reformer and the steam cracker. Um, and they are not so easy to electrify because of the high temperature. So if uh, we look at the at our current offering, uh, I mentioned earlier 650 C, we, we, we also have heaters which are running at eight, 900 C, but that's on a more exceptional basis. And uh, in addition, not at the megawatt rating which is needed for a, for a steam cracker, for example. But we are working on, on some of these projects and we are more in the area of the gas preheating, let's say up to 600 C and the uh, remaining heating in the hot zones um, are done by other technologies. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh. Do you have a time threshold for when, I mean, you said you're working on the possibility of these higher temperatures. Do you have a sense that that's something you will be in a position to offer within five years? Are we talking more or less? No, it's, um, so you're right. Watlo has heating elements which are going, let's say, uh, to 11, 11 to 1200 degrees C, but they are not very good for this kind of process heat applications. Um, with these traditional process heaters, let's say we, we stop at 700 C. Um, but the demand from the market is there, uh, driven by, by electrification to go to higher temperatures. So we have a, a team working on uh, solutions also for higher temperatures. I don't think it will be five years, uh, but I cannot commit to, to anything. But it, we, we are closer uh, with higher temperature solutions. OK. Gentlemen, thank you. There's clearly demand from the room. I think there's demand from the market for what you're both talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, um, this panel and... <laughs>